Uh, I'm Mark Hartley. Uh, about a lifetime ago, I made a film called Not Quite Hollywood, which documented quite a few films that are, can be found in the, uh, the Severin Cellar. I've got a film called Girl at the Window, and that hits streaming right now as you're watching this. I've been lucky enough to know David from Severin for quite a while. I've helped him when I can on, uh, on some of the films here. So we'll start with Felicity. If you want to see an Australian take on the great work of uh, Just Jaken, I guess Felicity is the closest thing you'll get. John Lamont, the director, who was a very, very great, funny guy, uh, who I thankfully became quite friendly with in his later years, set out to make the equivalent of a, of a Singapore Airlines television commercial. So it is shot with every single soft focus filter you can imagine. And it's quite explicit, but it's quite innocently explicit. It certainly won't offend anyone, but it will give you a chubby if you're in the mood for it. I had the very great pleasure to, uh, to document Felicity in Not Quite Hollywood, and uh, Gloria Annan was a really, really lovely uh, lady to chat to. And uh, she was certainly, um, like John, very unapologetic about the subject matter and actually thought that she was making a feminist statement uh, when she made it. So I guess that's for everyone else to decide when they watch it. Yes, that would be good. <laughs> Invaders of the Lost Gold. Well, look, this is hardly a recommendation. Anyone who's seen a frame of it will know that. A delicious piece of atrocity cake. I don't know what that means, and I have no idea who Funston is who uh, came up with that. But this shows when you can't even find a good quote for the film, it shows the quality of it. <laughs> what the hell's so funny now? I think that man don't like you very much. <laughs> but with a lot of these films, more terrible the film, the better the stories. And certainly Invaders of the Lost Gold is a film that sounds like it was the worst possible shoot. And you can tell just by the coverage, everything that went wrong. <laughs> Laura Jemser is suddenly just in the water and then she just falls under the water and drowns, never seen again. And I asked him why that was the case. And he said, well, because we had two minutes to film that scene. Something had to happen, so she had to vanish from the film. So I told her to go underwater. My apologies, Mark. I promise I won't shit can every film that we're looking at. End game. Yeah! It is great to see how fast these Italians jumped on the Road Warrior bandwagon. Well worth, if you're into post-apocalyptic films, End Game, Raiders of Atlantis, all with stadium shoots and um, with vehicles that certainly wouldn't have existed if Mad Max 2 hadn't have come along. Thanks for the confidence. See you around. Gwendolyn was a staple of uh, VHS uh, library visits when I was a kid. And I think what we all loved about it was the fact that it was like an Indiana Jones style romp that also had a very Euro erotic quality to it. It's rare that you see an Indiana Jones ripoff that is done with such style and done on such a, like it was a very lavish budget. I, the, I never realised, but the, the VHS that had been released in Australia was totally cut. And when I came to America as a kid, I managed to pick up a VHS copy which was called The Adventures of Gwendolyn in the Land of the Yik Yak. And uh, watching that, it had all kinds of stuff that I'd never seen before. Like um, at one point, a guy is pulled through a prison bar and his ears are lobbed off and remain on the prison bars. That was never in the release that I saw. It's so beautifully crafted and beautifully made and um, and a real lot of fun. One of those films that um, I think is just ready to be discovered uh, again. Yes. Turkey Shoot, another film where the stories behind the film far outweigh the, uh, the quality of the viewing experience. Very thinly disguised remake of Most Dangerous Game. Stories galore, obviously uh, everyone knows well, the most famous story about the film is only weeks before um, the shoot began, uh, a large chunk of the budget was removed and Brian Trenchard-Smith, the director, just had to 
make do with what he could. And to quote Brian, stunts may be expensive, but blood is cheap. So he turned it into a fast moving Lucio Fulci style gore fest. There is one of the, the best um, full body explosions I've ever seen in a film. Poor Olivia Hussey from Romeo and Juliet uh, comes to Australia. The crew wind her up about every single thing that can possibly kill her on set. Every single insect, every single snake, everything's venomous, everything will kill her and so she won't even leave her trailer. Roger Ward tells stories about shooting in a, um, in a billabong where literally a day earlier a crocodile had laid their eggs. People talk about them using real bullets actually firing at Steve Raisblatt and uh, they are ricocheting very, very close to him. So we don't know if all these stories are true, but we'd like to believe them. Christ, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Produced by Anthony Iganain, the Roger Corman of, uh, of Australia. Produced a large, large number of genre films. He's still at it. He actually has just produced the film that I'm, I've just made called Girl at the Window. And uh, he's still very much, probably the last of his generation of film producers in Australia still actively raising finance for films. Uh, he was on a roll. Um, Patrick, Snapshot, Thirst, Harlequin, The Survivor, uh, Race for the Yankee Zephyr, Turkey Shoot. Australia wouldn't have a genre film industry if it hadn't have been for Tony Ganane. Patrick, I guess I should chat about purely because uh, the director of Patrick was uh, Richard Franklin, who I met when I was actually at high school. He'd gone to my high school. I was lucky enough to invite him back to come and talk to the class. Uh, he had just directed Psycho 2 and Cloak and Dagger at that point. And uh, it was a friendship that lasted until his death. And um, he was the main inspiration for me wanting to make Not Quite Hollywood. I certainly saw that uh, a guy who had gone to Hollywood, had made all these films, had made great films in Australia like Patrick and Road Games, wasn't even listed in the, in the uh, history books on Australian film. So that was part of the reason why I really wanted to make that documentary and shine a spotlight on talents like Richard and like uh, Brian Trenchard-Smith, John LeMond. Um, my first narrative film was the remake of Patrick, which was a very different reimagining. We sort of made it more of a, a, a gothic thriller, whereas Patrick is all very much set during the day in one, well, in one hospital complex. You know, when you, when you talk about uh, Hitchcockian films, people obviously talk about Dress to Kill and, and De Palma's works and obviously a lot of the early Argento. But Patrick is certainly always uh, included on that list as being basically the only Hitchcock film that Hitchcock never made that had uh, telekinesis in it. Hitchcock never made any films with supernatural elements. And Richard and the writer Everett de Roche tried to remedy that with Patrick. <laughs> Another uh, Ausploitation classic uh, is Stone. People talk about Mad Max being, you know, the seminal Australian action film, but quite honestly, Mad Max wouldn't exist if Stone hadn't have been around. The stunt work in Stone is quite incredible, and um, all the stunties who worked on this subsequently, Train Grant Page, who went on to do Mad Max. And in a way, it's a shame because Sandy Harbert, who made this film, never made another feature film. It's his one and only film. It wasn't through lack of trying, but he just scared the funding bodies. He was the real deal. He was a biker who rode with these guys and he'd go in there to get financing. He'd obviously bring in some of his burly friends and uh, no one was willing to hand, hand over any cash to him. But he did leave us this. Um, Quite a strange film about a, uh, a cop going undercover. And when I interviewed Quentin Tarantino for Not Quite Hollywood, he was a huge fan of Stone. He said that he thought we'd spoken to real bikies who said that they thought that Stone was the most authentic biker film ever made. Forget about all those AIP films. This film is the one film that really did present the biker code uh, on the big screen. And I guess. That's reason enough to watch it. I've got better things to do with my time. Well, go and do it. In England, it came out after Mad Max, and their tagline was, um, after Mad Max, there was stone, which I see you've changed for the cover of this one, which always, I know, infuriated everyone to do with stone, because uh, 
George Miller, from what I understand, never really uh, ever talked about this being an inspiration or had any impact on his film, but Sandy was certainly very sure that Mad Max would not have existed if, uh, if Stone hadn't have been made. You do that, man, you ruin a good set of originals. Yeah, you kill their character. I think if you're a fan of The Changeling, uh, The Survivor will be right in your wheelhouse. It kind of, look, that cover art doesn't do it justice. That cover art makes it look like it's a particularly bad, pulpy James Herbert novel. Uh, which of course it's based on, but it opens with an incredible plane crash sequence and just um, amps up the creepiness from there. Its reputation suffered because it got cut down for its American release from I think close to 104 minutes down to 80 minutes and when they did that nothing in the film made sense and it always had a reputation as a film that didn't make a lot of sense. But thankfully, Severin uh, managed to find the original initial director's cut, 100 minutes long, really has stood the test of time. I think at the time it was the most expensive um, Australian film ever made. It might have been one of the first Australian films that cost more than a million dollars. I think it's a really, really great discovery. If you, if you take away anything from anything I've said today, it's go and watch The Survivor. My favourite Australian film when I was a kid was The Return of Captain Invincible. It's the only film I ever saw and then wrote to the producer and uh, about how much I loved it. And in the mail turned up a lot of glossy uh, photos and also a single, a test pressing of a single of um, the Captain Invincible theme on one side and uh, Name Your Poison on the B-side, which I still treasure. Choose your bows, let's hit the red eye! Think of young together, What's the, what's, how would you, it's even hard to explain what it is. It's, it's, it's nutty. Self-righteous, messianic, moralistic, and increasingly tedious. Well, look, I, I think the Christopher Lee actually, Christopher Lee wasn't, you know, his, his career was in a bit of a slump at this point. He's making films like Serial and so forth. And I think he really enjoyed coming to Australia and being able to lampoon his image, which I'm not sure he'd actually done at that point to a large degree. Obviously he turns up as Dracula in, um, in uh, The Magic Christian to some point, sort of lampooning his, his Dracula role. But certainly he'd never been in a full-blown comedy. And, you know, I'm sure that as soon as they said that you can sing a song, he, uh, he had booked a flight within no time there are two cuts of the film, and this is where it gets quite controversial. I have to say this, and Philippe particularly doesn't like me saying this, but I actually think the, the theatrical cut is actually a better gateway cut to enjoy the film. Um, it's the cut that I saw when I was a kid. It's the cut that's only been available up until recently when Philippe released his director's cut. Bullshit! Bullshit! Bullshit, 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 bullshit! Um, but the great thing is that you can watch both. It's uh, amazing and it's a, a tribute to Severin and just a tribute to, to collecting fans that a film like Captain Invincible can have such a release in the year 2022. Part of the Eurocrypt of Christopher Lee collection volume one is a film that I saw on television when I was a kid. In Australia on Channel 9 we had Dust Till Dawn movies every night of the week. And I stumbled across the torture chamber of Dr. Sadism uh, one evening and it blew my mind because it, it was one of the most atmospheric films I'd ever seen. For my mind, it's the best Mario Bava movie that Mario Bava never made. It's sort of so full of Bava style touches. There is one sequence in there which I will never forget and that is a stagecoach going through um, uh, woods with just bits of body pieces hanging from the trees. It's the only film that I own the complete uh, each reel to on Super 8. So um, it, was, it was a film that really uh, made a big impact on me. Uh, setting the alarm clock to get up at uh, three in the morning and watch it on the uh, Channel 9 Midnight to Dawn shift. Ay, 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 our trip's getting interesting. <laughs> Let's finish with two films that probably aren't familiar to uh, US audiences, certainly as as much as they were to Australian and UK audiences.
But from what I understand, remarkably, Zulu Dawn is Severin's, well, one of Severin's biggest sellers, which is quite amazing, really, considering it was never a big hit. Um, it was a film that was started by Cy Enfield. I think Cy Enfield wanted to make it straight after Zulu and never got around to it. And I think by the time the film actually got financed, he was too sick to actually direct it himself. And so Douglas Hickox, uh, the director of Theatre of Blood and lots of other good genre films, uh, came in and took it over. They obviously, the, the great thing about Zulu is totally UK cast, Stanley Baker, Michael Caine. Here they recruit Burt Lancaster to be the lead, uh, but an incredible UK supporting cast. It's as large scale as Zulu. I mean, Zulu is just a, an incredible film to see, but against the odds, uh, once again, it's become a really, really important part of Severin's library. Whereas The Wild Geese, seeing a film that had Richard Burton, Roger Moore and, and uh, Richard Harris in it. Rafer, sir. See that the men make their wills. Shaw, arrange transportation for the men to go into town. They can kiss their money goodbye if they're not back by 0400. Drunk, laid and parlayed. Well, they deserve it. Richard Burton is in the twilight of his career and certainly he would die uh, weeks before making The Wild Geese too. They, you know, there was posters up with his face on them. Two incredible pissheads who actually had to get on the wagon to be able to be insured to make this film. Uh, you, I can't imagine the struggles that they were going through. It is just such an old fashioned, comfy slippers and pipe movie um, that I, I literally visit the wild geese and um, it's kind of unofficial follow up to sea wolves at least once a year. One of my favorite films of all time, one of my top 10 favorite films of all time. And it's part of the Severin Cellar. You better hear him go home before your mama gets worried. <laughs>